Hi, everybody. This is Dean Cohen. I want to welcome you back to uh, another Dean Speaker Series. This is part of our uh, Brzezinski Initiative Speaker Series, and I am very glad to say that we have members of the uh, Brzezinski family in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, this is the brainchild of uh, the children of uh, Dr. Brzezinski, and uh, in particular, I want to thank Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, uh, who's with us uh, here. This is a very special uh, panel. We have three ambassadors who are going to talk about a dimension of Arab-Israeli peacemaking that, oddly enough, we don't focus on all that much, and that is direct Arab-Israeli diplomacy. There's actually a very long history of that going back to before the creation of the State of Israel, um, but it's really particularly come to the fore. So let me make our, uh, my introductions and then uh, step back and uh, listen to what will be a fascinating discussion. Uh, our moderator today is going to be Ambassador Eric Edelman. Ambassador Edelman is a distinguished practitioner in residence at SAIS. He was formerly the American ambassador to both Finland and uh, uh, to Turkey. Uh, he also served as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, in which capacity he and I spent a lot of quality time together doing uh, the work of the government. He's also been involved in Arab-Israeli diplomacy as well when he was stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv. Uh, we'll be joined by Ambassador Yusuf al Ataiba, the uh, ambassador of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, ambassador al Ataiba has been the ambassador of the UAE in Washington, D.C. since 2008, so a very long run. Uh, I think perhaps most importantly, from the point of view of this discussion, he was really in many ways the moving force behind what is a, a triumph of Arab-Israeli diplomacy, and that is the Abraham Accords. And our uh, third guest is Ambassador Jeremy Isakharov, the Israeli ambassador to Germany. Uh, ambassador Isakharov was stationed in Washington for a very long time. Uh, to include overlapping with the beginnings of Ambassador al Taiba's presence here. And they actually began some of the direct diplomacy, which eventually did lead to the Abraham Accords. So these are three imm immensely talented uh, professionals, um, and they can really talk to us about how the business of diplomacy can really achieve some great things. So with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Ambassador Edelman and uh, turn my camera off and enjoy listening to and watching this great panel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dean Cohen, and thank you to the Brzezinski family for this initiative. My, uh, my office at SICE is uh, catty corner from uh, Dr. Brzezinski's uh, old office. Um, I visited it recently for the first time in almost a year, um, and uh, because so much of his library sits right outside my door, I frequently feel that uh, his spirit, uh, you know, is uh, s still present there, uh, and I hope his spirit will help uh, animate this conversation, as Ambassador Otaiba suggested just before we we came on, and I'm sure it will. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, two people who uh, couldn't be better situated to uh, discuss the subject that uh, Dean Cohn has asked us to go into, and so I want to start this conversation among colleagues uh, by turning to Ambassador Taiba and then Ambassador uh, Sakharov, who, as uh, Dean Cohen pointed out, uh, was in some sense present at the creation uh, of the first formal conversations between uh, the United Arab Emirates and, and Israel, um, to first address the question of the changing strategic environment uh, in the region that has given uh, birth to the potential to have a shift like what we've seen in the Abraham Accords reached this uh, summer, in which you played such an important role, Ambassador Otaiba. So I, I would like both of you to just address initially, how has the strategic environment changed? What enabled uh, these developments to take place? Eric, thank you, Dean Cohen. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me start by saying it's really nice to be on a panel with two very dear friends who I've known for a long time. And I have nothing but the utmost, utmost respect for. Great to be with you, Eric and Jeremy. Uh, I think you're starting off with a very strategic and poignant question, Eric, which is 
it's not just the deal. It's not just the transaction. It's not just, you know, the signing ceremony in the White House lawn. It's what were the conditions that allowed this to happen? How did the landscape change over the last 10, 15, 20 years that allowed, uh, you know, one of the countries in the Gulf that was one of the members that boycotted Egypt when they normalized with Israel to then come full circle and to normalize with Israel, you know, many years later. I think the region has changed, continues changing, but it certainly has changed. And let's just walk away from the Abraham Accords for a minute. And I actually think it's tomorrow will be the two year anniversary of the Pope's visit to Abu Dhabi. I believe tomorrow is February 5th. That will be the exact two year mark. If Eric, you and I were talking five years ago and we thought or we discussed the idea of a Pope visiting Abu Dhabi or anywhere in the Gulf for that matter and hosting a mass for 180,000 people, we would have probably concluded that that was crazy. It was unlikely to happen five years ago, just five years ago. But here we are welcoming a Pope's visit, building an Abrahamic house. Here is a conservative Gulf country putting money into a public synagogue right next to a church and right next to a mosque. So I'm taking the long way to try to describe some of the social and the economic and the political shifts that are taking place in our region. You know, the Abraham Accords is one reflection of those changes and those shifts. We can analyze it from a policy level. We can analyze it from a, you know, a human interaction level. But I think we are, we have recognized and we've concluded that if you take all the geopolitics away, it is still in UAE's best interest to normalize with Israel. You have two very dynamic economies, uh, two very uh, forward-looking countries, uh, visionary leadership. There is no reason we shouldn't be talking to each other and doing business and trading and investing and researching together. Doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything. There's no two countries who agree on everything. We're going to have a very dynamic, very strong economic and investment relationship, and we're going to have tough conversations on Palestine. I mean, both can happen at the same time. And I think that's what we realized a few years ago, and we decided we want to take this step. And I think the annexation debate that occurred this summer is why it happened at the time it happened and the way it happened. But minus annexation, I think it's fair to say that this was probably on the trajectory. Couldn't tell you if it was going to happen a year from now or five years from now. But I think an the annexation debate is what gave us the detour to make it happen now. And now, as you see, there's enthusiasm from both sides. Uh, it's a little tampered because of Corona, but I feel like once we've turned the corner on Corona and flights are back and travel is back and people can move freely and safely, I think you're going to see a very, very healthy and dynamic relationship between the two countries. I want to come back, Ambassador Otaiba, to the question of coronavirus in a minute. But first, I want to ask Ambassador Isakharov if he can comment a little bit about the shifts in the region um, you know, going back really 25 years to your first initial contacts, uh, formal contacts with uh, UAE that have led to this moment from the Israeli point of view. I think you're on, on mute, uh, Ambassador Sakharov. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, there you go. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric, for that, uh, uh, for those words. And uh, for me, it's also a, a great pleasure um, to see Dean Cohen uh, hosting this as well. And my good friend, uh, if I can say, uh, Yusuf Aloteba, who has been, uh, I think, one of the most uh, amazing colleagues over the years. Um, and in many ways, that kind of way, kind of answers your question, in the sense that uh, you know I, I was probably one of the happiest Israelis to see the signing of the Abraham Accords, but um, bearing in mind how far back our discussions go, it was already very clear to us in the, the mid uh, '90s. We were also after the Madrid conference, the Oslo process. Um, and how uh, the UAE and Israel began a conversation which over the years evolved and developed 
in a way that really reflected a very strong common interest between the two countries on a whole range of issues. And I'm not just talking about strategic issues. As Yusuf said, the whole idea of innovation and, uh, uh, and creative thinking in many ways, not only in diplomacy, but also in, uh, in sciences and uh, health and other areas of uh, agriculture. There's a tremendous amount in which our countries can uh, cooperate. But it was also happening, and I'd like to say that the, the uh, Abraham Accords was, if we take a step back, it was also happening on the backdrop of a relationship that Israel had also with Egypt and with Jordan. We've had peace treaties. Um, and frankly, over the last years, we've had a very uh, important, vibrant, very discreet, quiet uh, level of uh, security and intelligence cooperation with these countries. Um, and I would remind, even recently, with all the problems with the Palestinians, we've also renewed security cooperation with them. Uh, and I think that our conversations with the UAE in particular made us realize that there's such a whole range of issues that we can discuss. And you can, beyond uh, bilateral issues, which have, I agree, there's, there's a tremendous potential here in terms of investment, tourism, exchange, people to people, business to business. But also when we sat down and talked about the various issues, and we could talk about Iran, we could talk about in all of its different aspects, Syria, Hezbollah, Lebanon, the importance of Egypt, the importance of Jordan, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. We saw, a ho I used to sit down and it's true what uh, Yusuf says, we don't necessarily agree about everything. And frankly, in every conversation, the Palestinian issue was always brought up and we discussed it. Um, we didn't always agree on everything, but it was to me amazing how much we did agree about. And it wasn't because we had decided to be, have the same opinion as uh, the UAE to make them feel better. We, I felt it was a really important process of how the interests converged, not only between UAE and Israel, but between other Gulf states as well. And I mean, I used to come out of some of these conversations thinking the Arab-Israeli conflict, what is it? I, it, it was very difficult for me to even understand given that level of, uh, uh, of, of understanding that we had between us. And I think if we fast forward to the, uh, to the uh, agreements that were signed, they've been uh, extended also to Bahrain, Morocco as well. And I think there's still a potential uh, to broaden that even more. That was with Sudan as well. I won't leave that out. Um, but I think that it, it, it's part of a growing process. It's part of a convergence of regional interests. Uh, and I think it's also very important that this should be seen as producing a re more regional voice. Um, and Yusuf and I uh, served in Washington together and we've, we speak to the American, obviously, with the American administration. Yusuf still does. I, I'm in Germany. Uh, but but I think it's so very, and you will tell me, when you hear something that is so um, similar to, you know, and, and is, let's say, a regional concern, not just an Arab or not, not just an Israeli concern, you look at it in a different way. And I would say that the understandings between Israel and the UAE can also be reflected in other uh, relations and contacts that we have with other countries in the area as well. So it's, so it, it, it's a much broader, I think, uh, sweep of, of what's actually going on. And that's the important part. Here. <clears throat> I don't want to dwell uh, too much on the geopolitics um, uh, because as Ambassador Taiba said, I think uh, there is now much more of a a vista of opportunity that is out there that I, uh, in the future that I want to um, get your uh, reactions to. But uh, I, I do just want to underline uh, one point. So when I uh, was still in government uh, between 2006 and 2008, when you were Ambassador Sakharov, the Deputy Chief of Mission here in, in Washington, and um, Ambassador Taiba was a senior advisor to Sheikh Mohammed, and, and then at the end of that time uh, in 2008, arrived as ambassador, I began to appreciate uh, a shift from my meetings 
um, in the Arab world and in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and, uh, and in Israel, uh, that the picture was shifting because uh, people uh, had a common sense of threat emanating from Iran. And I just want to, you know, get your reaction to the, the underlying feeling of threat to the region uh, from Iran is what I think precipitated this uh, opening up of other strategic possibilities because uh, of the common threat that people felt from Iran. And that uh, to the degree that uh, countries in the Arab world had uh, perceived a threat from Israel, um, they uh, began to see that maybe it was less of a threat than they had thought and that the challenge from Iran was more overwhelming. Is that a fair, a fair statement, Ambassador Taiba? And then Ambassador Sakharov, I'd like your reaction to that. Absolutely. Uh, I don't think anyone in the Emirates ever believed Israel was a threat to the national security of the UAE. I think we had political differences uh, and those political differences were sometimes manifested through the Arab League and the Palestinian issue. But you know, the fact that I was, a, I was friends with Jeremy for a very long time before the Abraham Accords said, well, we could still talk and meet and discuss. And like Jeremy said, we agree, if we listed 10 items in a meeting, we would probably agree on eight or nine of them and disagree on one. And so those conversations you know, kept going. But yes, I think one of the things that brought us closer was a common perception of the Iran threat. But that is also coupled with, hey, these guys are really strong in technology and innovation. These guys are really strong on research. They're really strong in uh, desalent. There's a, another series of, of reasons and points where we should be talking to them because it's in our national interest as well. And I think finally, the, the convergence of both the common threats, but the common opportunities got to a point where it just made sense to, to do this because it's in both countries' national interest. The, my favorite part of the Abraham Accords, my absolute favorite part, is that no one really had to lose anything. No one conceded anything. This was a win for the United States. It was a win for UAE, and it's a win for Israel. Everyone benefited. That's why it was so widely received and widely hailed. So I think this is what diplomacy is all about, is finding the formula where everyone benefits from a deal ultimately. Couldn't agree more. Ambassador Sakharov. Um, I'd like, uh, actually, I, I, you know, as you said, the, the conversations go back many years. And for, for, for the sake of history, the interesting thing was, is that I remember the conversations between Israel and the UAE really becoming more strategic exchanges were actually in the years 2001, 2002, uh, prior to the second Gulf War. And it was at that time that we, uh, while we had you know, an eye on Iran, um, there was also a lot of concern directed towards Iraq. So, you know, the conversation, and, and again, I really uh, agree with Yusuf that uh, this is, you know, when we were sitting together, it wasn't just, oh my God, there's this threat, we need to cooperate, we need to this. It was the fact that we could sit and have a serious discussion of assessments. This was not a UN discussion where you're blaming us, we're blaming you. And it was a serious exchange of, I think, two serious countries that wanted first and foremost to get an analysis of what, uh, not only what the threat could be, but to realize what the opportunity is. And I always came out of the conversations far more captivated by the sense of opportunity and the fact that, you know, the possibility of an Arab-Israeli dialogue in a very serious way was simply, uh, simply reality. And again, uh, I, I came out of the conversations thinking, you know, where, you know, where, where is this Arab-Israeli conflict, okay? You know, you have to make a distinction between the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue. And, but I still think that that type of conversation between Israel and the Arabs will be one of the most important bases for solving the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue. Um, so I, I uh, definitely think that uh, this was, uh, you know, Iran was a serious issue already then on the table. It was an emerging threat in terms of the missile uh, activities, 
But then in 2001-2002, as the, uh, the uh, sites in Natanz uh, and Isfahan were, were revealed, um, it also very much emerged on the agenda. But again, it was an important factor, but it wasn't the determining factor of the bilateral relationship. Uh, in about 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to uh, turn to our audience for uh, questions and answers. So I'd encourage you, if you have a question, to please put it uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, and I'll curate the questions for our, our panelists. Uh, I want to return to uh, what Ambassador Taibo was talking about with regard to coronavirus. Um, uh, clearly, that's going to be the uh, overwhelming uh, priority for uh, President Biden and his administration in dealing with uh, uh, COVID here at home um, and uh, with the economic fallout from, uh, from the pandemic. Um, Israel has done a remarkable job of, of vaccinating uh, its population. I say that somewhat enviously as I sit here in Virginia uh, waiting um, to... to uh, for my number to come up to get my, my vaccination as someone who's over 65 and therefore eligible. Um, but I wonder, you know, is there a potential here now because of the Abraham Accords uh, and because we know that pandemics are the uh, quintessential transnational issue that require international cooperation to solve it, uh, we will never actually, you know, uh, be on the other side of this pandemic unless we all cooperate um, globally to, uh, to deal with it. Is there potential here for uh, UAE and Israel and uh, uh, perhaps others uh, to, uh, to you know, jointly address uh, some of the issues, making sure everybody gets vaccinated and that uh, we can put this pandemic behind us? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a strong believer in depoliticizing certain things, right? I think we have made a very conscious decision in the UAE that once corona pandemic, you know, really once we realized the impact of the pandemic, we were going to depoliticize it. We sent corona assistance to initially actually to Israel and to Iran, to Syria and to the US. This is about humanity. This is about safety. This is about us getting back to a normal lifestyle. Uh, so I, I think Abraham Accords are not, you know, the things like pandemics, climate change, these large issues that are only going to get resolved with global collective efforts need to be depoliticized and just seen for what they are, objective challenges that everyone needs to line up behind to fix. So I, I strongly believe that things like this, we in Israel and anybody else who wants to participate should participate because this doesn't get resolved until all the countries have addressed COVID. Just because UAE and Israel have vaccinated you know, over half their population doesn't mean COVID is going away. Yeah. Ambassador Sakharov. No, I, I look, um, I think the fact that Israel, uh, the UAE and Bahrain were able to uh, mm. vaccinate their populations in such an effective way is, uh, it, it also shows again and underlines the degree of uh, similarity between these, let's say uh, we're, we're not massive countries, but we're able to organize ourselves. We're advanced uh, in a digital way. Uh, and that had, and having the uh, infrastructure of getting these vaccinations on the ground and implemented, I think shows uh, in many ways just how much we have in common in terms of our societies. And I think that uh, cooperation, uh, there's been cooperation also in terms of developing the vaccines and testing them in the UAE, which has been, had a very major uh, um, uh, pr um, testing uh, uh, effort. Um, I think this shows that we can, uh, first of all, I think it's absolutely important to depoliticize it. Uh, it is a regional threat to everyone, and we have to try and do whatever we can to reduce the uh, level of infections. Um, and, but there are also many other issues that we can also develop in terms of innovation, desert agriculture, uh, water, preservation. And I think there are even issues that can be very important, not only between Israel and the UAE, but between our other neighbors as well, that could be a basis for broader uh, regional cooperation. But definitely the cooperation on Corona has been a very important and uh, I think uh, it shows a great, it says a great deal about the 
potential in the relationship. Mm -hmm. We've got a number of questions now that are coming in from the audience. I just want to ask, uh, take the um, advantage of um, my role as moderator to ask one more, and then uh, I'll start going to those questions. Um, Ambassador Otaiba, I think, was uh, being a bit modest, actually, when he was talking about the timing of the Abraham Accords and the role the annexation issue played uh, in the sense that uh, he himself uh, wrote a, a fascinating uh, op-ed uh, published uh, in the Israel, translated into Hebrew, published in the Israeli press uh, that I think helped uh, in many ways um, catalyze the, um, the negotiations that led to the Abraham Accords. Um, I wonder um, if now six or so months on, uh, either of you could speculate a little bit about how um, the uh, Palestinian-Israeli issue, um, Palestinian-Arab-Israeli issue can be reframed in a way uh, that allows uh, more progress to be made. I mean, obviously, uh, Israel's politics are a little bit complicated, and I want to delve into that part of it, but um, how might we think about reframing the issues in the context of what's been achieved uh, and the potential, as Ambassador Sakharov said, for even more states to, uh, to normalize, more Arab states to normalize with Israel? How might the issue be reframed in a way that enables uh, progress? Um, who do you want to go first? Eric? Uh, Ambassador Taba, I'll, I'll start with you and then, and then let Ambassador Sakharov respond. So I think the, the Arab Peace Initiative approach, which was, right, we're all going to hold together. No one's going to do anything until there is a full solution based on 1967 lines, and then all Arab countries will normalize as a block. I think we tried that for 18 years. It didn't work. So we're now trying something different. Uh, it's now the approach of each country goes along its own path. And I think maybe in, in our case, we got some concessions that were very important for the Palestinians, the spending annexation, which salvaged the two-state solution. But if other countries want to do that or choose not to do that, that's, that's up to them. I mean, at the end of the day, what they choose, the, how they structure their deal between the Israelis and the Americans, that's ultimately up to them. But I think it's still important to address the Palestinian issue. And whether we do it through a collective front or whether we do it Privately, I think it's too early to tell, but I was recently on a panel at the Washington Institute earlier this week, and we were talking exactly about this question. And, and the, I think the conclusion of the panel is, if you want to address the idea of peace politically, kind of as a final solution, chances are we're probably not going to succeed. But if we try to make progress on quality of life issues, on movement, on uh, broadband, on... Uh, things that improve the everyday Palestinian access to resources, to jobs, to technology. If there is a plan that is spearheaded by the United States, including others, I think a lot of countries would be willing to participate in just taking incremental steps, hitting singles and doubles of trying to improve people's life on a daily basis by providing resources and jobs and, and so on. I think that is a more realistic approach than saying, let's have a big conference, Let's talk about the two-state solution. Let's try to find, you know, let's bring Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas and try to fix this. I'm, I'm not hopeful that solution will work. Ambassador yeah. Sakharov. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, we have to be minded also of the, let's say, the broader agenda in, in, within, in Israel now and also with the Palestinians. I mean, we'll be going into elections in March, on the 23rd of March. Palestinians have an intention of, create, of having elections in May. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I think it would be doubtful to imagine that before then, I mean, there'll be the elections in Israel in March. Um, and usually elections aren't a time uh, for like breaking new ground, maybe in certain respects, but I don't think in the respect of the Palestinians. So I think you know, until the government is formed, it would still take a month, a month and a half. Um, and so it'll, that is something that will have to work itself out. And then the uh, Palestinians 
if their plans go as they wish, they'll be into elections in May. So I, I, I don't think that we're in, you know, on the verge of, uh, of uh, major breakthroughs, but I really think it's important. One of the things that we saw in the Abraham Accords that I frankly couldn't understand was why the Palestinians came out against it in such a way, against normalization and against the actual you know, broadening of the basis of peace in the area. I, I simply didn't understand it, particularly, as was said on our side, we are moving from annexation to normalization. Um, and so that was, I didn't really couldn't understand why they felt that that was so important to them. But then I did uh, feel about a month and two months ago, there was a, a change with a renewed security cooperation, as I've already said, they began to receive uh, revenues uh, that we hold for them. Um, uh, and these are substantial amounts of money that we wanted to provide them, but they didn't take them up till then. Uh, and that has uh, hopefully eased the economic situation in the area. Uh, that we've also been cooperating with the Palestinians on the COVID issue. Uh, here again, it's not just a, a problem of theirs, it's a problem of all of us. Uh, and now that we have made pretty good um, roads into vaccinating uh, uh, the uh, Israeli population. We're beginning to share uh, uh, mm -hmm. vaccinations with the Palestinians, and they're also receiving, uh, as they also wanted, uh, vaccinations from, from Russia as well. So first of all, I think, you know, this is a time where I, I agree. I don't think we, we will have big major steps. I think the possibility of broadening the uh, dialogue between Arab and Israeli uh, uh, countries is going to be critically important in providing the basis for a renewed effort in the Palestinian front. Um, but I think in the meantime, there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, first of all, between us and the Palestinians that can increase and improve the atmosphere. But I also think we should also use our new relationship um, with, for example, countries like UAE to find ways that will also benefit the Palestinians as well. We've got, I think, a list of about 23 questions, and I don't know that we're going to have enough time to get to all of them, but I will do my best to try and group some of these uh, together because some of the questions either overlap or, um, or complement one another. So uh, we have a group of questions about uh, Iran and the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, and the Biden administration's uh, stated intention to um, try and re-enter some, in some way or form uh, the, the JCPOA. Uh, one of the complaints that both Israel and the uh, Gulf states had about the JCPOA at the time it was negotiated in 2015 was the fact that so much of this went on uh, without very much consultation um, with the regional uh, parties who were in fact uh, partners uh, of the United States. So I'm, I'm curious to know, and I think some of our um, participants are, are curious to know how your two governments are thinking about uh, what they are looking for from the Biden administration on this question. Um, how, how do you anticipate the Biden administration will move forward in terms of uh, the JCPOA? Will they um, uh, coordinate uh, more effectively with Israel and the UAE? Uh, or will we see a repeat of what we saw in the Obama administration where it was more of a direct effort to engage Tehran rather than uh, US partners? Ambassador Otaba. So I'll, I'll try to give quick answers so we can get through as many of the questions as possible. I've spent a lot of time in the last two weeks talking to senior officials from the Biden administration, from Secretary Blinken, uh, Jake Sullivan, Rob Malley, Brett McGurk, people that we've worked with in the past. And the one thing I've seen so far is they have learned the lessons of what did not work the previous time, that they are much more sober and conscious of the realities of what transpired throughout the last four years, but also what kind of position America is in today. America is in a much stronger position today you know, whether you agree with how we got there or disagree with how we got there, you know, maximum pressure has put the U.S. in a stronger position, has put Iran in a weaker position. Low oil prices has contributed to that. COVID numbers in Iran have contributed to that. So the fact is you are 
much stronger in a much stronger position today to negotiate either a, GC, a JCPOA 2.0 or JCPOA with a follow-on. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a clear understanding of that. There's also a clear understanding that last time we were not consulted, it was done behind our back and that's really what broke the trust and that's what harmed the relationship. They're very aware of that. They're making sure that they're reaching out uh, several, you know, repeatedly to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again. At the end of the day, I think there is a way forward. I think there is room for a deal, but we want a deal that is stronger, that is longer, and it addresses our issues with Iran's behavior. Issues like missiles, like proxies, like interference. These were never addressed. These are as dangerous to our part of the world as the nuclear file. And I think, I think the Biden team does understand that. So I think we're positioned to get a better deal if that's the intent. Uh, let's see if that's what we're able to achieve. Ambassador Sakharov. I, I won't repeat a lot of what uh, Yusuf has said, but I think, look, it's very clear there is a regional voice now that reflects a very strong regional concern. It touches not just the nuclear area and, and you know, if you, anyone makes any assessment of the status of the JCPOA at this point in time, it's clear that there have been, in, even in the last few days, major violations of the uh, nuclear provisions in the sense of uh, advanced centrifuges, 20% enrichment, uh, the whole range of different uh, uh, violations that have essentially taken out uh, the, any meaning to this being a, a, an accord of nuclear restraint. Um, I also think that one of the things that has not changed since 2015 is a deeper a strategic change in the Iranian thinking, whether in terms of its missile production. And here, one of the things that I... Uh, uh, I comes up very much in conversations with the colleagues, uh, Arab ambassadors also in Berlin, is the concern regarding the proliferation of small, accurate missiles, uh, uh, not only to other countries, but also particularly to non-state actors, terrorist organizations in the area. Um, and this is not, these are not theoretical issues. These are things that, that are touching on our national security, and I think others as well, in a very real time. So uh, look, at the end of the day, I don't think you cannot, this is not 2015, we cannot turn the clock back. We have to look forward into a way that if you're looking for diplomacy, it must encompass an element of pressure, a very significant element of pressure, and it must also encompass a very significant element of deterrence. Um, because you know, when you have uh, such uh, activities happening, you, 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 can't, you need an all-embracing approach that will provide uh, a, a major element of deterrence to Iran uh, to prevent it from, uh, from impacting other, area, other countries' uh, security in the area. Um, uh, and so I, I think I'll stop on that and be happy to go on with other questions. Well, of course, I just want to drill down into this uh, one level uh, deeper, which is um, both uh, of you have talked about uh, all the major factors that have changed. I agree with everything both of you have said in terms of where we are today as opposed to where we were six years ago. One of the major things that has changed, uh, of course, is the Israeli exfiltration of the Mohsen Fakhrizadeh uh, archive of Iran's past militarization activities, uh, which uh, we didn't have um, before uh, the JCPOA was signed, um, and which speaks to the fact that Iran, uh, there are a lot of activities that Iran denied or hasn't reported to the IAEA. I, I wonder if uh, either or both of your governments are weighing in with the Biden administration saying these past failures to account for Iranian activity have to be accounted for before any kind of further agreement can be contemplated. Is that something that both, both sides, uh, both Israel and UAE have um, concluded and talked about with the Biden administration or not yet? So I think that's a great point for the Israelis to make. The point that we make to the Biden administration is we have a nuclear program and many people have coined the gold standard and we've been coined the gold standard because we don't have an enrichment or reprocessing pro uh, program. And that makes it very safe and it makes it very clean. Why are your friends being held to a gold standard when your adversaries, the one who scream death to America every day, are held to a much lower standard? 
So I, I, I pose that question to which I don't get an answer ever. <laughs> and you and I have discussed that many times in the past, and I agree with you 100%. Ambassador Isakarov, anything, any light to shed on the, um, what use is being made of the archive in trying to hold Iran to account? Look, that has uh, already been a very uh, important conversation uh, between Israel and the United States, uh, not, uh, not starting now. I mean, you know, the relationship is also existing on the professional level, and uh, uh, America was uh, uh, advised at a very early stage of, of the principal findings in that. So, but obviously, the, look, this is a new administration now. Um, uh, it's going to embark on a whole range of consultations. We're in the beginning of our contacts with the, uh, with the administration, with the people who are also dealing with the issues, mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with uh, Secretary Blinken, also with uh, Rob Malley. Uh, so I, I think it'll still take uh, a, a bit of time to work through these discussions. And also, look, there'll be, frankly, discussions with the Europeans, with the Russians, with the Chinese, but we will definitely uh, chime in. And again, I hope the, the, the regional concern and the regional voice will be heard in this respect. We've got a number of questions that have come in about uh, the potential for uh, military cooperation and military to military cooperation uh, between and among uh, Israel and um, the states that have normalized uh, relations with Israel. Uh, what are the prospects uh, for that? I mean, uh, one of the issues, of course, everybody faces is, uh, in uh, going back to Ambassador Taiba's comment about Iran's ballistic missiles, put aside the nuclear question, just the conventional missile capability is a threat to both Israel and the UAE, and in particular to the UAE's economic and tourist infrastructure um, uh, and energy infrastructure. Um, so um, what are the prospects for cooperation on things like shared early warning or uh, missile defense uh, or other uh, potential uh, military activities that would uh, benefit both, both sides? I think the potential is great. Uh, we haven't really had our ministries of defense and our militaries engage uh, intensively yet. I think it's partly because of the political situation in Israel. But I, I think we've already, we've already seen UAE Air Force and the Israeli for Air Force participate in training exercises in the US together, for example, and in some European countries. So I think we're starting from a good place. I think it has a lot of potential, not just on the military, but also on the research and development aspects of military and armaments. So I, I think there is, I'm very hopeful. I don't think we've managed to really kickstart that process yet, but that's largely because of the, pol the politics in Israel. Yeah. Ambassador Sakharov. Yeah, I think that again, I, I think like uh, as, as with other areas as well, this is a, a definitely an area that has, that has potential in many different respects. Uh, uh, it could also, um, look, uh, I think the, uh, our countries also have a very strong interest in doing everything we can to prevent counter-terrorism ter counter um, in many different aspects. And uh, I think we uh, share in many ways uh, similar views of where the threats are, who are the parties, and how, how can we work to... Uh, to uh, prevent this getting worse. So I think the, the, the idea is not just, uh, I mean, uh, ballistic missile cooperation is, our, is something that we've uh, invested, as you know, a lot of uh, time and effort in dealing with, given the uh, problems we've had, whether emanating from Hezbollah or with Hamas. Uh, but I think there is uh, also an interesting development here in the sense that uh, Israel now has been brought into CENTCOM, which uh, also provides um, a basis, not just of, uh, uh, of cooperating bilaterally, but also within the context of a broader uh, cooperation. Also, I mean, look, UAE and America are very close. We are very close with the United States. So it provides a, a way of harmonizing uh, these issues in a much more effective way. 
Uh, I'm glad you uh, brought attention to uh, the move from uh, UCOM to CENTCOM, which I think is long overdue, and I, I hope will facilitate the kind of thing both of you have just been discussing. We've had another uh, set of questions that are adjacent to what we've just been talking about, and that has to do with uh, the potential for uh, uh, UAE and Israel to cooperate in in space-based uh, activities. Um, uh, you know, both uh, Israel and UAE have had uh, astronauts, um, you know, uh, fly space missions uh, with the U.S. Uh, what, what kind of prospects for joint um, uh, space activities is there? I think that's something we expressed interest on very early on. And I think the prime minister actually tweeted something after the Abraham Accord saying maybe we should send two astronauts to space together. Again, this is one of those things that need not be political. This is about the future. This is about science. This is about going to the next frontier. We should, we should be doing it with as many partners as we possibly can. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's, you know, uh, the other day I must be uh, just, it's a bit of a different thing, but look, I think there could be a lot of areas that we haven't thought about. Uh, we had about uh, three weeks ago a, a trilateral conversation between the German Chamber of Commerce, the Israeli Chamber of Commerce, and the UAE Chamber of Commerce. And it was an amazing conversation of a, uh, an hour and a half in which ideas just kept coming forward through the conversation, through the discussion, in, in every single area. Uh, and this was, in fact, one of the areas that, you know, definitely could be, uh, definitely could be pursued. It's a very interesting area. We've been, uh, you know, we'd like to think of ourselves as a space-faring nation. So uh, I think it's definitely uh, uh, on, on, uh, on the table. Um, I want to uh, maybe turn the conversation a little bit um, away from uh, the technology side, um, although I, there's obviously more we could talk about, about uh, the potential for high-tech cooperation, not just in space, but other, other domains as well. But um, uh, Ambassador Otaiba, I mean, the, the UAE has, uh, I believe is still uh, today, the largest sovereign wealth uh, fund uh, or aggregation of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. Uh, what are the prospects for significant um, Emirati invest, direct uh, foreign investment in, in Israel? Israel is, you know, a very, as we've been discussing, advanced high-tech nation. There's plenty of um, scope, I would say, for foreign direct investment to um, uh, boost um, that even further, uh, would, would have all sorts of mutual benefits. What are the prospects there in your view? Uh, very strong prospects because that was one of the things that initially demonstrated the most enthusiasm. All of a sudden, not just the sovereign wealth fund, but all the business families and the entrepreneurs and startups who now have access to an important market with important technology and innovation. It was, uh, it was like a very, very mutually excited two sides rushing to meet each other. And <laughs> I remember speaking to someone in Abu Dhabi in the economic department. They were supposed to send me some paperwork on something. And he said, I'm really sorry, sir. I, we've just been overwhelmed. I'm a little, I'm a little late, I apologize. I said, it's okay, but what were you overwhelmed with? He said, we have so many Israeli companies reaching out to us, trying to set up shop in Abu Dhabi, trying to basically open offices that we just can't handle all the incoming traffic. So I, I think it's both ways, actually, Eric. I think the Israelis are excited about doing business in the Emirates, and I think the Emirates is excited about being able to do business in Israel. It's going to take us a while to kind of understand the landscape on both sides, but the energy and potential is definitely there. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, Eric, uh, um, in, uh, just after the accords were signed in Washington, there was a trilateral meeting in Germany, in Berlin, with Sheikh uh, uh, Abdallah, the foreign minister of the UAE, and Gabi Ashkenazi. Um, and we had a really good uh, bilateral meeting, and then there was a trilateral meeting with the Germans. Uh, and that was actually one of the first things that came up in the bilateral meeting was the uh, investment agreement that we needed in order to protect investments, promote them. So I, uh, I have no doubt here. And as uh, Yusuf said, uh, I can't even count the number of phone calls I get all the time from Israelis who want to come. And, you know, this is, look, and the number of Israelis that have already visited uh, 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 Dubai, uh, have been uh, quite uh, quite amazing. 
So I think this is something that all we have to do, we have to open the doors, get the people to come together and it'll, it'll move in a very, uh, I think in a very brisk way towards uh, uh, working together and finding the right balances between the different investment possibilities. I, I want to take this uh, opportunity personally to ask you to uh, convey my best to both Sheikh Abdullah and to Gabi. Gabi was briefly my counterpart um, when he was uh, Director General of the Defense Ministry when I was Under Secretary. Of course, uh, mm -hmm. you know he, he's now moved on to greater things, and I've, I've gotten to know Sheikh Abdullah over the years through Yusuf's in, uh, uh, inter intermediary role as ambassador, and they're both uh, terrific. And um, so, best to both of them uh, as they pursue these all, all these opportunities. Um, we're, we're running out of time. We, we, I think I'll close on this one question because I think um, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, several people have expressed the desire as individuals what they can do to help move forward and facilitate um, this uh, extraordinary dialogue um, that has begun between the two countries and which you are both exemplars of uh, both historically and uh, today. Uh, so from a people to people point of view, uh, what, what kinds of things can people do to help uh, you know, facilitate this exchange and help enrich it and, and make it broader and deeper? Uh, let, let me take this first and I'll, I'll pass it on to Jeremy. But I, I think the most important part of the Abraham Accords is basically the potential for increased understanding. I know we're here at SAIS and we're talking about diplomacy and geopolitics and that's important. At the end of the day, Emiratis need to understand, appreciate, and respect Israelis, and Israelis need to understand, appreciate, and respect Emiratis. For that, you need to get, they need to get to know us, we need to get to know them. As one of our uh, prominent businessmen said, no, 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 we can always do business. I need you to come meet my mother. If you really want to get to know me, you need to come to my mother's house, we need to have lunch or dinner. We need to kind of understand where we're coming from, our values, our culture, our history, who we are as a people. If you build that, you will have not just a warm peace, you will have a very productive, healthy, vibrant relationship. To me, that's the foundation of the Abraham Accords. And I'll finish off with this story because it's, it's funny and it touches on your first question, which is how the region has shifted. So yesterday I met with my new Israeli counterpart, Ambassador Erdan, who just arrived, who's covering both Washington and New York. God bless him. <laughs> it's not an easy task. But just to demonstrate how much the region has changed, first that meeting was, he was tweeting into pictures and now it's public where <laughs> me and Jeremy's meetings used to be private and, and snuck away in little corners. And I offered to host a dinner for him, a welcome to DC dinner. The only reason I can't do it now, obviously, is because of COVID. But just think about that for a second. The UAE ambassador to Washington is thinking about hosting a welcome to DC dinner for the Israeli ambassador. Uh, we'll figure out when we can do it, but just think about that. Think about that's where we are in 2021. That's fantastic. Um, Jeremy. Yusuf was always a, a groundbreaking diplomat in my opinion. And, and in many ways, I. One of the things I think which is so important here is that, you know, Yusuf and I became very uh, close colleagues because we always had a very credible, honest, straightforward relationship. And there were times when you have to say things that are less agreeable or more agreeable, but we, you know, you, when you create a level of trust, I, to me it was amazing that you, uh, an Israeli and an, an Arab can make such have such a relationship and make it so profoundly close so quickly uh, and so in that sense i think uh, yusuf and i made peace many many uh, years ago and i think the main uh, purpose of the abraham accords today is to show that there is another way yusuf said in the beginning of how in the past we've all lived with our narratives and with our ideologies and how we need to look ahead and sort of see how that what happened in a quiet, discreet way is now happening in a more public way and how much the Abraham Accords can affect and change and create a new dynamic in the region to one of openness, 
greater understanding and of coming to more agreement rather than looking for always the things that divide us. So to me, that is the, uh, I think it's an inspirational thing, but I think it's a very uh, important factor to take into account. And I think one of the things that can be uh, really important is that our friends in America, our friends in Europe should be mindful of this deeper change and they should look at it in a very serious way. Um, and we haven't spoken about the Eastern Mediterranean and what's happening there, which is, I think, also a very big factor impacting on a lot of people's uh, in, in the area's uh, sensitivities at this point. Um, so I think that there's, you know, there is a kind of a new Middle East out there, and I don't mean it in a kitschy way, but in a way that, that you know, there, there, is, there is a very deep change, and I think it's important to try and reinforce it as much as possible. Well, Ambassador Sakharov, I very much agree with you, uh, as you might imagine, about the Eastern Mediterranean, having had a little bit of experience with one of the disruptive influences there myself, personally. Um, but I, I really want to thank you both uh, very much uh, for really an extraordinary conversation uh, this this morning. Um, and and uh, I commend it to our audience. Uh, when you think about it, uh, going back uh, 25 years, uh, you know, uh, this is an example of what great diplomats and what diplomacy can really accomplish, like dropping a stone in a pond 25 years ago, the relationship you and um, uh, Ambassador Sakharov and you, Ambassador Taiba, have had has rippled out uh, and led to this literally world historic event um, that uh, took place last summer that's you know, changed the region. And in that sense, I, I commend you both as a, a uh, recovering diplomat myself. Um, I, I salute you for uh, what you've done and uh, thank you for this conversation today. Thank you. Great to be with thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.